How's everyone of you today? You survived the evening? So you're, we're from Queensland, so we can say that. <laughs> um, now, uh, just a few things before we get started. Um, Mary is not going to join me today, so um, she feels like she needs a bit of a rest today, so she's going to take that. So I think so she's fine with that. The other thing is that uh, some people from A Current Affair have rocked up. Um, guys, want to just put up your hands so that you know? Now, um, I've asked, they've asked me to whether they can be present with you filming you as a group while I'm speaking to you. And of course, my answer is, what do you guys want to do? Now, you need to be pretty honest with yourself here. If you don't want that to occur uh, as a majority, then we'll ask the guys to leave and they can try another time. Um, if as a majority you do want that to occur but some of you don't, then we'll have to let them know individually who, who doesn't want anybody to be photographed and so forth. So as a majority, how do you feel? Is the, is it a, is it, who, who feels they're perfectly okay with that? And who feels that they're not okay with that at all? Now, perhaps you guys uh, could just take notice of the people who are not okay with it. If you could leave your hands up, you guys. And the only thing I ask of you is that you just respect the proceedings, which is just basically going to be a question and answer proceeding today. Um, so that's fine. Yeah, go ahead and set up what you want. Um, um, People who have put up your hands to not, it may help if you do sit in one location or something like that together. Um, can, you, can you just put up your hands again for those of you who feel that you'd rather not? Um, would you be happy to sit in one location? Um, so, so that way it makes it simpler for the guys. Um, which, if you make it over here in this corner somewhere, yeah, then... Um, I would just perhaps like to remind all of you something about the media. It's very rarely that they're focused on truth. And, uh, and so you may find that uh, while if many of you, they, they, some, I feel that many of you may be asked uh, why you're here and things like that, don't be surprised if only bits and pieces of your answer is used. They have a way of severely editing things to sound completely different to how you said them. And they're very good at it. So it's just something to remind you about. <laughs> yeah, Mary just said that apparently we were in the Melbourne Sunday papers today. Um, it was a five minute over the phone conversation that I actually had with a person in Brisbane uh, that's prompted all this media attention all of a sudden. Um, so, so today now they wanted to have some television uh, shots and so forth. So we'll see where it all goes. I would say that it's all not going to go in a very good direction, shall I say. But... <laughs> But, uh, when I say that to you, please bear in mind that my attitude towards everyone is, a, is an attitude of love. So, I, I, you know, my, the people in the media are my brothers and sisters just as you are, and I'm going to treat them consistently just as I treat you. And, uh, and also, I feel that all of us can demonstrate love to them, no matter what the response is. And I feel if we do that, as things progress then the love will eventually win out in the end. I'm a great believer that love cures all ills. Yeah? So that, that's how I feel. So while you can't, we can't really say that in the interim, well, already the media attention has been a little on the negative side, and, and uh, 
and that's just uh, often media outlets looking for a sensational story. And, um, and I suppose in some way my claim that I'm Jesus could be considered to be sensational. Um, the thing is I don't feel it's very sensational, so, um, so that's why I, it often, I often wonder why they're interested in this little guy travelling around with his girl uh, answering people's questions. Um, but uh, obviously there's more to it than that and, and uh, eventually I feel there'll be more of a desire for people in the world to know the truth rather than know the facade. So we'll see what happens there. Anyway, how are you all feeling now? <laughs> Not the same as when you first walked in. <laughs> uh, that's a pity. If what you're feeling now is worse. <laughs> um, how did you find yesterday? Good? Confronting? And uh, many of you had some of your questions asked. Uh, of course, I have long-winded answers, so that makes it... And so does Mary now. She's somehow caught that from me, I think. And uh, <laughs> so that takes time. Um, but often there is a lot to a question, actually. If you think about your questions, often what we view as a very easy question um, has many aspects to it of understanding. And... One thing that I find interesting is that a lot of people struggle to listen to the whole answer because there are so many aspects to the question that need to be answered so for the question to be answered fully. Does that make sense? So that's why myself and Mary have a tendency to ha um, answer questions in a very, uh, like, as with as much detail as we possibly can because we feel that's important and it's also a gift of love as well to give our time to you to answer as many questions as you have. And of course you can take that away with you and do whatever you want with that. You don't have to believe anything that we say to you at all. And in fact Mary and I don't expect you to believe anything that we say to you. However, we do have an expectation in some ways. When I say an expectation, it's more of a general treatment of ourselves in that if I treat you lovingly and you treat me lovingly, it really doesn't matter who agrees and who doesn't agree with what's being said. That's how I feel. And the key is learning how to love each other rather than all having the same opinion. Like you don't, We don't all have to have the same opinion, but we do need to understand a lot more about love as a human race. Don't you, don't you agree? So that's, to me, the focus. If we can learn more about love, and there's two forms of love, there's God's love that can enter your soul, and then there's... Your love, the love that you can nurture and develop towards other people. And if we can develop both forms of love, then it doesn't matter how much a person disagrees with another, they'll never go to war with them, they'll never get angry with them, they'll never fight with them, and all of those kind of things would never occur. Does that make sense? But as soon as we get out of harmony with love then now we want to defend or we want to get angry or we're upset with people. And as soon as we get angry and we're upset with people, we're straight away out of harmony with love. I don't personally believe that there's anything such as like righteous anger, for example. Now, many of us in the past probably have believed there is such a thing as righteous anger. I have a right to be angry because such and such treated me this way or such and such treated me that way. The reality is, from God's perspective, there is no right to be anger, to, to, to anger at all. And it doesn't matter what happens, there's no right to anger, if that makes sense to you. Um, so that's something for us to bear in mind as well about love. Anyway, let's uh, continue with the questions. I didn't finish... Patricia's question. Um, there was four parts to it, and I think I answered the first three parts. Is that not correct? Yes, I think you did, AJ. Yeah. Yes. And the fourth part was, what's going to happen in your neck of the woods? Is that, was that the yes, fourth part? Yes, thank, thank you, AJ. You have a very good memory. <laughs> it's so interesting how all of us are interested in our little neck of the woods. Don't you find that interesting? Rather than interested... We're all world citizens and yet we're still interested in our neck of the woods. Um, 
What was happening is myself and Mary have been investigating with communicating with uh, quite a lot of different spirits as a process, in the process, investigating uh, what's happening in the future over the next couple of years to a large, uh, to every place on earth, basically. Now, of course, uh, those discussions are taking part over a period of time and they take a, quite a lot of effort because we're wanting to write down the details and record the details of our discussions. And what we want to do in a few months' time is prepare, present a summary of those discussions to everybody. And that summary will give a summary of the events that will potentially, as these spirits feel, will potentially uh, affect the earth over the coming couple of years. And what we're doing is we're trying to investigate clearly, not only, which is very unusual for most people who do mediumship work with regard to spirits and earth change events and things that are happening in the future, what we're trying to do is offer um, some, val some, um, some kind of proving system to prove that, there, that some of the events that have been already predicted will occur. So to do that, what we've got to do is see what the spirits that we're speaking to are going to predict over the next couple of months and then, and then we see whether those particular things come true and then we have some degree of rapport between the spirits that are giving us the, inf the information and the, and the likelihood of it being true. Does that make sense? Because if you, if you just take every... like If you look historically with the New Age movement, um, what's happened with regard to you know, events of the future is there's been huge amounts of predictions made by spirits or, and through channelling into people on Earth, but uh, many of those predictions have not come true. Um, some have come true and many have not. And so we need some way of validating, don't, don't we? Um, what's really going on. Now, it would be reckless to, uh, of us, and I have in the past actually been reckless, <laughs> uh, but I'm not as reckless anymore. Um, it would be reckless of us just to present information that we can't validate to you. So rather than tell you a whole list of things that we believe are going to happen to your area in terms of... Um, over the next couple of years, both politically, economically and also in regard to the earth itself, it's far better if we investigate the, all of the different areas of the earth without any focus on one particular area. We, we want to you know, give all people on earth an opportunity to know the truth about it, not just people in your particular area. And then what we want to do is collate that information together with some degree of proof and certainty before we give that to people. And it won't be, and I, please bear this in mind, it won't be what myself and Mary are saying to you will occur. It will be what spirits who have communicated with us are saying will occur and, uh, and what we've asked them to investigate and give, being reflected to you. So um, we, we want to do that for everyone um, who's been listening to information about the path. So rather than answer the question specifically for the Albury area, what we would prefer to do is go through this process where we've got all of those details and what we want to do then is put those details in a written form on the website so that all of any person who's interested can download that information. Thank you, AJ. Is that all right? Thank you. No worries. That being said, many of you have had different dreams and different feelings about what's going to happen anyway, have you not? Now... Can I just put to you, though, we have emotional blockages preventing us from, the re from receiving information. So can I give you an illustration? Imagine this is your soul, and let's say, in this case, I'm a male soul, so it's a male. And let's say I have specific information where whenever a woman is involved, I want to protect her feelings. So the, so the emotional injury that I have is attempting to protect the woman's feelings. All right. Now, in a day-to-day -day life, this emotion will often be being exposed already. So in other words, I'm driving along the road, I almost have an accident, 
but I don't. I have a narrow escape. And then I think, well, if I tell my wife, she'll just get freaked out, right? Because I want to protect her feeling of fear. I don't want her to feel afraid, you know? And so what I do is I don't tell her that it happened. I leave that bit out of the day, if you like. Right? And then when I'm protecting a woman's feelings, uh, I overhear a conversation, let's say. I overhear a conversation where the, the people are conversing about my wife. Right? And it's not that good a conversation, you know. They're, sort of, they're, they're saying things about her that I know she wouldn't be very happy to hear. And because I want to protect her feelings, I don't say that bit of the day either. Now what's actually happening is that basically I'm not yet really being totally honest and open with my wife, am I? I'm withholding information from her to protect her feelings. Now for, for, for some relationships this gets even worse. The man goes off and has an affair. And then he tells himself, I can't tell my wife because she's going to freak out about that. And she's going to be really upset about that. And I'm going to protect her feelings. And so he doesn't tell her that either. Now can you see how straight away there's not much truth going on in the relationship? And it just depends on the level of the events in their life as to how much of he will actually expose to her. And he's saying to himself that it's all done to protect her feelings. Now, that might be true in the sense that he may have an emotional injury that he feels like he has to protect the woman's feelings at all costs. And many of us have learnt that from our mothers, have we not? How many of you would have an accident, come home and not tell your mother about it? You'd tell your dad, but not your mother. Like dad would accept it, mum wouldn't, you know, mum would, mum would be into you about it, so you don't tell her. And so we learn over a period of time to protect mum's feelings, stop mum worrying about us, even though we're really reckless. So if we get drunk one night, we don't go home, because mum would be stressed about that. So and we just tell her, no, we stayed at a friend's house, you know. But we don't tell her that we were drunk, staying at the friend's house. We, stay, we don't tell her the bit that would distress her, right? Now underneath that also is another emotion probably and that is really I'm protecting myself from mum's fear or anger. Right? So in other words the motive I have of protecting my mum's feelings is not as pure as I think it is. Right? But the reality is, I'm really just protecting myself from what mum might do to me if she found out. And so I protect myself in that way as well. Now, the problem with this kind of, there's just one emotion. Now, let's say as a person, we now enter a communication from us with a spirit. So, in other words, we now have a spirit talking to us about future events. Every event that's going to stress out the mum, I'm going to have trouble listening to. Can you see that? Because as soon as I know, oh, but that's going to, if I tell, I can't tell mum that. So we close that down. So, so what happens in our communication with spirits is that we become very, very blocked to certain types of communication and very open to other types of communication depending upon the emotional condition of our soul. Does that make sense? Now, in the case with earth change events, almost every single person on the planet has a primary, one primal fear. And you know what the primal fear is, don't you? The fear of death. The fear of... Well, for some, it's not the fear of death so much as the fear of a painful death. Right? So there's one. But the fear of death is one of the biggest emotions most of mankind has. Well, we don't need to have it. If we understood the truth about death, we wouldn't worry about death at all. It would just be like another event in our life, just like uh, you know, having a car crash today was an event in the life. It would ha have no more significance than that, in fact. But because we have so much primal fear that we have not released as a human race about death, 
Death is the worst possible thing that could happen to us. Right? And as a result of that, anything that's transmitted to us from the spirit world regarding the potentiality of death is immediately felt to be very stressful. Have any of you guys seen a recent movie called uh, Hereafter? Yeah? It's a good movie to watch. It's a Clint Eastwood movie that he, he put together. Really good movie. Um, it's, a, it's about... I won't tell you too much, because if you haven't seen it, you know, I'm spoiling the whole story for you. But it's about a man who basically does not want to channel information because he's tired of channeling information about death to people. And, uh, and so, as a result, he tries to run away from the gift of being able to hear from spirits and tell people uh, the truth about what the spirits are saying. So, so this is what happens most of the time, is we, our emotional condition, the condition that's inside of us emotionally, prevents certain information from being said to us. And to be frank, right now, inside of yourselves, there are certain emotions that even prevent you from hearing what I've just said. So if you've got a fear of spirit communication, a disbelief that it can occur, you've never had a personal experience of it and you've never seen anybody that has had an accurate personal experience of it or you've gone along to a medium who was just a, a fake, you know, like someone who just made up a whole story to suit, to suit it. Um, if you have any of those experiences, the high likelihood is that you're going to dismiss that, that spirit communication can actually occur. Can you see that? And so, and so even our belief system prevents us from being open enough to hear any new truth, whatever that truth may be. The key, of course, is to be open to the answers. So, so what we're trying to do with the earth change uh, question is rather than be all sensationalist about it and so forth, we're trying to become as open as possible to hearing all of the answers. And we're trying to assist a group of people who we know are very good mediums to actually go through the process of reducing all of their fears so that the spirits who are trying to communicate them to them can actually communicate some ac with some accuracy the future events. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So that's why we want to have more information about that given at a later date. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? I know you're a fountain of questions, Patricia. Okay. Okay. Let's go, <laughs> and then across. This is just my warm-up question. Okay. Um, it relates to what we were talking about yesterday, mm -hmm. with the <coughs> different dimensions, and when you were explaining about yourself and Mary returning in a soul union state. Yep. Is there potential, which you have mentioned, that we can be also in a soul union state, but be in, be in our separate bodies of our soul mates totally. while we're on the earth? Totally. And if we did that, yeah. would that lift the... I know you don't like the term vibration, but it, would it lift the love on yep. the planet? Of course. That we would, the planet would shift from the first dimension to back towards what we originally were? Were as yep. the sixth? Yep. We originally, we were in the sixth. We could even go better than that, though, couldn't we? If more and more people embraced love, we could actually do better than that. But yes, yeah. what you say is definitely the truth. The, you see, the, the issue is that the condition of the planet is dependent upon each of us as individuals. It's our desire to love that determines how the whole planet works and operates. Remember yesterday I said how there's a whole lot of unloving systems on the earth, many of which we live in day to day and we just accept. Because we've become so attuned to accepting things that are unloving. And so what we do is we accept, you know, that, yeah, I saw this guy, you know, yelling and screaming at his partner this morning, and I just accept that as a fact of life, and I accept this as a fact of life, and I accept all these other things. I accept the spanking of children, fact of life. You know, and we accept all of these different events, but when we actually tune into them with our feelings and feelings of love, we go, wow, that child really got hammered. And not only that, actually that child was being assaulted by its own parent. 
Like, if, if that parent was, was belting somebody else in the same way that that parent had just belted its child, the parent would be put on charges for assault. And yet, the parent, we accept, treating the child in the same manner, in the same, like, the rage and the, and the, and the violence, we accept it towards the child. And we have a lot of acceptance towards a lot of things for the same manner, for the same reason. Where we wouldn't accept the treatment of me treating you in that manner, but if I'm treating my child in that manner, I'll let get away with it, basically. As a society, we let everybody get away with it. And so there's obviously a lot of tolerance for unloving behaviour. Now, there's a difference between tolerance for unloving behaviour or intolerance to unloving behaviour and actually loving the person through their unloving behaviour. So I'm not suggesting just because now I notice the parent assaulting his child, that I now feel like assaulting the parent, you know, and giving the parent something for, or yelling at the parent, or telling off the parent, or whatever. What I'm suggesting is we need to understand the causal emotional reason why the parent decides to assault the child in the manner, and we need to assist the parent to not do that anymore. And if that parent doesn't desire to do that and continues to assault his child, then we need to do something about it, just as we would if, the, if that person continued to assault an adult. We need to do something about that. So, so what we need to do on the earth is we need to all start focusing more and more on what would love do, what, what, what's the underlying principle here about what love would do. Now, obviously, imagine... So here's the, here's the earth. At the moment, the earth... And people on the earth still tolerate to a large degree unloving behaviour. Not only towards each other, but also parents tolerate it towards their own children. And also society tolerates it from one culture to another. So in other words, we have a lot of racial tensions where whole races tolerate. You know, one race feels that that race I do need to punish somehow and I, I have anger with that race. And so there's a lot of racial intolerance. There's also a lot of economic intolerance where people who have more money don't tolerate the people with less money as, well, as much, or the people with less money judge the people with more money and so forth. And then we have a lot of intolerance with regard to um, the whole worldwide issues, such as religion. So you look at how much religious intolerance there is. So every religion is meant to be about love, and yet they can't love each other. Does that... That's quite a lot of intolerance. Now, so on the earth, there's this great, these, these great misunderstandings about love. Now, you imagine for a moment that, that groups of people started to pop up on the earth who actually now started to understand love better. In other words, they understood that even this religious intolerance is not acceptable. Not acceptable for themselves anymore. Not for other people. What other people do is up to their will. But for, for themselves, they will no longer tolerate within themselves any intolerance of another for whatever reason. They will no longer tolerate within themselves any unloving behaviour towards another. They will no longer tolerate within themselves unlovingly treating their children, their family, their friends, their, their environment, even their environment like things that are non-living in their environment or things that are living in their environment, such as trees and animals and plants and so forth, they no longer intoler tolerate unloving behaviour towards all those things. So we have a whole group of people now starting to understand that the way to start the revolution, if you like, towards love on the earth is to not worry about the tolerance of other people, but first to look at inside of each individual and go, as myself, so I look at myself and go, oh, why was I unloving in that circumstance or situation? Now, obviously, yesterday when I talked to you about the dimensions and all the pr progressions of love, really, what they are, aren't they? So, you know, we're in the first sphere on the earth here, and the second and third, fourth, fifth, and so forth, and there's all these dimensions, many of which have been proven by science, but they are actually dimensions of love. Where, well, they're separated by very varying boundaries of love and obviously the boundary here is very different to the boundary here in the sense that we're growing in love as we progress. Now, if you imagine on the earth that, that maybe just a few people on earth arrived in the dimension, which is the eighth dimension or the eighth sphere, which is called the 
time we're at one with God. So in other words, now we have all of God's opinions about how to treat every single person on the planet inside of us automatically. We don't have to try. It just automatically happens. Just having a few people on earth in that condition would immensely change the face of the earth. Can you see that? In terms of how people would respond. But if you imagine that a hundred people arrived in that condition. Now this is not a soul union condition yet because the soul union condition is a much higher condition again. But you imagine if a hundred people just arrived in that condition, what would happen to the earth as a result? There would now be a hundred people on earth who understood love completely, who got love in their heart, who knew how to practice love in every single situation, and they loved their enemies as much as they loved their friends. Right? And they have no resistance to any... Um, they have no intolerance within them. There's no resistance to any of their own emotions anymore in them. And so they no longer are intolerant of other people. They tolerate all forts of behaviour, including a slap in the face, without actually, without actually responding to it. You imagine the power of that space. That's a very powerful space to be in. And the beauty of being in that space too is because of being at one with God, you're in this beautiful condition of love where you're permanently connected to God. So what that means is that you cannot be unloving. Do you follow me? You cannot be unloving in that space. So you imagine that, not being able to be unloving. Like just because it just, it, it's automatic for you. To, to, to do that. And not only that, you know that you are loved in that moment. Does that make sense? So in that moment, you know, no matter what's coming at you, no matter who dislikes you, no matter what they anger and rage and frustration and all the other things they project at you for staying in a condition of truth, you know that God still loves you. And you know that you're doing the right thing, being in a loving state the entire time. So you imagine being in that state for a moment, which is only a small part of what it means to be at one with God, and that's in the eighth dimension. So your question relating to the soul union state, imagine if many couples got into a soul union state with each other while they're still in two bodies on earth, and the effect of the love that that would have on the earth. It's going to be immensely powerful. And every single person has the opportunity to do that. Every single person. Any person on earth has the opportunity to do that. The problem is, is that most people historically haven't known how to do it, and so we don't do it. But we have the opportunity to do it. And, and so it, I suppose in some ways I'm painting a utopian picture, but, but the potentiality of that in terms of the effect on the earth can be immense and actually can transform our total environment. So, you know, all those unloving systems we talk about talked about yesterday, you know, the, the unloving religious system where all these different religions all proclaim to have love, but they can't love each other. And the unloving political system where, you know, they don't even proclaim to have love, they just fight with each other and particularly fight with other countries, right? Then you have unloving economic systems where the people who are poor get poorer. So the people in the most poor parts of the world continue to have their resources taken from them and so forth in, and given to the people who already have a lot. And so we have this vast discrepancy in love going on in the econo economic system. And then if you look at every system, the environmental system, the energy system, you, almost any system you name, there's not much love in any of the systems. There is a lot of uh, expedience in the system in the sense of like do what's easy to do or what seems to be easy. But in the end, myself, I myself feel that actually love is the easiest thing to do, believe it or not. Because in the, in the end, you get the penalty of the unloving behaviour automatically if you do unloving things. So, so why is there political uprisings in many countries right at this moment? The main reason is because the governments of those countries have had a history of unloving behaviour towards their people. And sooner or later, the people get sick of it. And many of them eventually revolt against the unloving behaviour. But if the government knew how to, give, to do, unlo do loving behaviour, then it would be different. But, but the government is made up of the people. And the people haven't yet learned how to love 
So how can the government become loving if the people are still unloving? It's not possible. And this is where we need to reflect upon our own personal condition. Because if I change, now the world has the potential to change. But if I expect everyone else to change, and I don't take any responsibility for any change inside of me, then in the end, nothing's going to change around me, actually. And in fact, if I act upon my unloving emotions, the, the emotions that are addictive emotions inside of me, the emotions where I demand and expect things from other people and so forth, and I act upon them, I'm actually contributing to the unloving behaviour of the world. In other words, I'm going in the wrong direction, or when I say the wrong, the unloving direction, rather than going in the loving direction. That makes sense. Long answer again. Huh? That's okay. There was a part B to that question a part B. as well. Oh, let's go for it. Um, no, it's all right. I've lost it. I've lost the part B. Sorry it about that. It was good. That's possibly my fault. <laughs> Too long an answer. And um, there was somebody over here who had a question. Um, sorry to get possibly back to where we were. Um, in, from reading uh, supposedly your history in the Bible, um, you <coughs> got bad spirits, put them into pigs and sent them over the ravine. Does that mean that there are bad spirits that can talk to us? Um, there are certainly bad spirits that can talk to you, but I did not put them in a, into pigs and chuck them over a ravine. Oh, that was such a good story. Yeah, it's such a good story, but... <laughs> but so, so how do we would a man who speaks of love do such a thing to a heap of pigs? It's just a good story. The pigs don't deserve it, do they? Sunday school story. Um, so how do you discern whether you're hearing appropriate things that you should take notice of? Um, a good, good question, very good question. About from spirits, you mean? Yes. Yeah, good question. And we had a bit of this discussion outside before the group began, actually. Um, and I can explain to you what we need to do. Every single one of us, so if I draw one of us, every single one of us is surrounded by people. You're surrounded by people living on Earth, um, so let's put all the people living on the earth over here. So there's both males and females living on earth. Whoops. He's a cross-dresser. <laughs> there's males and females living on earth. But on top of that, there are males and females living in the spirit world, of course. Now, every single person, of course, who passes from this earth goes to the spirit world somewhere. Now, if we could remember that the spirit world is constructed in such a way that every single person goes to a location that befits, that is the most loving location for their soul development. So, so for example, a person who's been an axe murderer on earth, the most loving location where they can live is right down the bottom of the first dimension. And that area in the, in the spirit world is called the hells. Now, it's not fiery torment or anything like that, but it is a location that befits the soul condition of the person who has been so unloving as to murder other people. And then there's a second dimension and a third dimension and a fourth dimension and so forth. And the reality is that actually the earth itself exists still within the same sort of environment, if you like, spiritual environment and moral environment as the first dimension. So, so in other words, if we drew the earth, the earth would be appearing in this dimension, right? In terms of in that same way of feeling. The, the morality of the first dimension matches the morality on earth. In other words, there are many murderers who still would like to murder in the first dimension who have passed over. In fact, every time we have capital punishment of a murderer, we're sending a murderer into the lower of the first dimension, still with the desire in his heart to murder. You know, he st still has, because that hasn't been usually taken out just through being punished. 
So the earth itself has a range and then at the top of the range in the, in the, in the, on the earth is generally people who are very, very giving to others. And you could say that they might sort of be more into the second dimension of the spirit world where they've sort of gotten rid of a lot of their own rage and anger and they're now in a place where they require a lot of peace and they are loving in their general demeanour towards other people, right? And there's very few people in the third and so forth and obviously very rare to find somebody much higher in these dimensions in the spirit world. Now here's me or you living on earth, surrounded by this group of people who are on earth, and then you're also, on the other hand, surrounded by a group of people who are in the spirit world. Oops. Uh, was, um, I'm going with blue and red for the, today for the girls. Right? So there's these people in the spirit world, and there's the people who are on earth surrounding you. And every spirit is just a person who used to live on earth. Right? So everyone's okay with that up to there. Right. Now, here's me or someone like us. And we've got all these external influences on us. You know, our neighbour rings us up. Oh, did you see that article in the paper about the economy? And you go, yeah, yeah, I saw it too. What do you think about that? Oh, it's looking real bad. And, and so we have a discussion. And in that discussion, what is actually happening? The, the different feelings of those two people are sort of merging, aren't they? Right? Or you could have another discussion go on where somebody says, oh, did you see the article in the paper? No, I never read the paper. Oh, okay. Um, well, in the paper it said about the economy going really bad. Oh, I don't believe that. Now, the two people are separate from each other in their opinions, are they not? And probably getting wider apart. Can you see that? Now, on Earth this happens regularly, doesn't it? And we take no notice of it. It's just a normal day-to-day -day occurrence where we all have interactions, some of which we agree with and others we don't agree with. And the ones we agree with, what do we generally do? We go along with it until such a time as we're shown that it's wrong by some event or some situation. The ones that we don't agree with, we don't agree with until such a time as we realise, oh, they were right. And then we generally accept their opinion. Although we usually go through some anger, resistance, rejection first before we accept their opinion, don't we? Can, can you see that? Now, the interactions with spirits are exactly the same. The only difference is you cannot see them. So in other words, they're still influencing you through the same emotional reasons that a person on earth can influence you. The difference is that you just cannot see them. And believe it or not, they're dropping thoughts into your mind very, very regularly. You just cannot see them doing it. It's very interesting when you meet up with a person or a group of persons who, who can actually see spirits the same way as they can see people. Right? There are quite a lot of people on earth now who are getting into that condition where they see people and spirits is almost identical. And in fact, uh, what often happens for those people, we know one lady in Greece, she, she's, she's given up trying to get her driver's licence. Because she'd be driving along the road and she'd see a woman walking across the road with a pram and she'd put on the brakes and scream to a halt and, you know, cause some major traffic congestion behind her and as a result. And it was a spirit walking across the road. And everyone's beefing her, saying, what are you, crazy? What's going on? And she'd be riding along on the back of the motorbike of her boyfriend. And uh, she's only about 20, 21, something like that. And she'd say, stop, 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 stop. She'd start shaking him and then he'd be going, what's wrong, what's wrong? And drive straight through the spirit, right, that she could see was walking across the road. So naturally, she's struggling to go and get a licence as a result of that. But she sees spirits as much as she sees people. And it's very interesting when she's around because she actually sees the spirit dropping the thought into the person. We were sitting down in a discussion with, this, with about 30 people in Greece last time we were there. And this one girl was describing, as it was occurring, every spirit that was dropping a thought into every person who was actually present. 
And there was in particular one woman who was present and she had three spirits around her and her entire conversation with me was driven by three spirits with her. She didn't have a single thought of her own in the entire conversation. She believed they were all her own thoughts and yet those spirits were dropping the thoughts. And this woman who was sitting next to me just described the entire thing right, to, to the group, which is very interesting. So these spirits are there dropping thoughts into the minds of people just as much as people on earth drop thoughts into the minds of people with the exception as the people on earth have to do it via the phone or face-to-face -face activity, do they not? Whereas a spirit can just drop it into your mind and even make it seem like it's your own thought that you've just had. Right? So then the question becomes, well, what do I do with this? There's thoughts coming at me from the spirit world, obviously, left, right and centre. How do I know whether the thoughts are motivated by love, whether they're good thoughts or whether they're thoughts from darker spirits who are motivating me? How do I know what's going on? I've got no idea of knowing. But the truth is you have a very clear idea of knowing. It's a very easy way of knowing. And the easy way of knowing is you've got to be able to feel the person. You've got to be able to feel their feelings. And when you can feel their feelings, you can automatically tell their intention. D does that make sense? Until that, you will just try to guess their intention. So, for example, if you cannot feel my feelings, you will believe my intentions may be very bad. Right? Uh, uh, there's this guy saying he's Jesus for a start, so, so surely... You know, he's already got some pretty bad intentions. If we just judge the intention without actually feeling the feelings of the person. Can you see? But when you feel my feelings, does it feel like I'm trying to get popularity somehow or get approval from anybody or acceptance? Or what do you feel from me? You see, this is the thing you've got to allow yourself to do is to, what, to feel the other person. So, for example, many of you in your day-to-day -day life do this a lot, without even noticing. You're feeling the intention of the other person and acting upon the intention of the other person without actually listening to what they're saying to you. Many of you do this, right? Many of the, you ladies are better at it perhaps than the guys are because they got, us guys are generally a bit more cerebral, cerebral and so what we do is we try to use our intellect a bit more. But many of the ladies trust their intuition a bit more. But imagine there's an interaction between two people. So there's a, a woman and she's... She's feeling the male. So remember the previous example I gave. Let's say that's her husband and he's just cheated on her. Now many women get suspicious before they know anything. Don't they? You've seen this happen in the lives of others. I'm sure he's cheating on me. I'm sure he's cheating on me. Like there's a feeling in them. And they ask him and he says no. And they ask him again and he says no. And five years later they found out that he was. You know, or that he confesses it then. Now, how did she know? She knew because she could feel something in him that she didn't trust. And see, this is what we often do with our feelings. What we do is we feel something from a person and we go, oh, no, yeah, logically, that doesn't make any sense. And, and I, can't, I don't have any reason to believe that about that person, but there's just something a bit, hmm, a bit off that I can't trust. Right? Now, the problem is that we could actually have a group of spirits influencing even that thought. Oh, don't trust that person or trust this person or don't trust that person and trust this person. So what we need to be, do is become so sensitive to our feelings, our own feelings, that we can tell the difference between our own feelings and the feelings of people around us. Do you understand what I mean by that? See, many of us are not that sensitive to the difference between our own feelings and people around us. For example, some of us walk through life with hardly any fear and the only time we feel afraid is when people around us feel afraid. And then we start feeling afraid. But this happens a lot with the economy. This is how the whole stock market works generally, isn't it? Everybody feels confident and so there's no, not much fear in the stock market. Everybody feels it's going up and nice and stable and so everyone buys stock. Right? And, then, and then there's a feeling of lack of confidence. And it goes through humanity, particularly in the Western world, like a wildfire, doesn't it? In a day, you can have the whole stock market fall 
just because of fear. Nothing's changed. Like the, the company that was there yesterday, in many cases, is the same company with the same amount of employees and the same, and all of a sudden its, its whole shares drop 20%. And why? It's only because of the fear or the lack of confidence that a whole group of people manifested at the same time. So fear, like everything, is contagious. Anger is contagious. You see this happening on footy fields, right? Particularly, not so much here in Australia, but you go over to the soccer, you know, in, the, in Europe. And sometimes the soccer can get pretty violent. You've got one side, all of one, you know, supporters, and the other side, all of the other supporters. And before you know it, there's major mayhem between the two supporters. And I can sort of understand that, given how slow the game is. <laughs> Sorry about those people who are passionate about soccer. You know, I'd rather watch AFL footy or something like that with a bit more movement. But, um, but you can sort of see the frustration in the, in the people develop, building and building. And in fact, the game itself is almost an expression of the frustration of the people there. In, you know, how long it takes to get a goal is almost an expression of the frustration of the people who are attending. And what happens is the mood is infectious. We become infected by the mood surrounding us and if it connects with us emotionally, we will be affected by that mood, guaranteed. Right? Very hard not to be. Now, the same applies with our spirit friends and everything else. So, so what that means then is if I am sensitive, if I'm the person here sitting on earth and I'm sensitive to the emotions in these people and I'm sensitive to the emotions in these people who are influencing me, I will then, and also I know my own emotions. So you can see I, there's three things I've got to do. I've got to be sensitive to what I feel and then I've got to be sensitive to what people on earth feel and I've got to be sensitive to what people in the spirit world feel, but I've got to know the difference between those three sets of feelings. Now, to be frank, that is quite easy to do if you're sensitive to your own emotions. But as soon as you start blocking down your own emotional, you know, you start suppressing your own emotions, what happens then is you automatically detune yourself from feeling the emotions of others correctly as well. And because of that, you will start accepting things from being said to you which may have a completely different ulterior and ulterior motives than what you believe them to be at the time. Whereas if you are emotionally sensitive, you can feel the intention of the person far easily, more easily. And when you feel the intention of the person, you know what they are going to do with that particular information and so forth. Does that make sense? Now... The only difference, once you're sensitive with regard to your feelings, is that the people on earth you can see, and quite often they're being fake, aren't they? Like quite often people have a smile on their face, and you, what do you feel from them? Yeah. yeah. You, know, you, you feel like, it almost feels like there's this tiger growling at you, and you have a smile on their face, you know? Whoa, that's, that's a lot of deceit. Now... These people in the spirit world can attempt to do the same thing with you, but if you trust your feelings, you, go, you can feel the... You know, coming at you. You can feel the attempt. Also, if a person loves you, they will never threaten you. So, they will never threaten you. They will never bribe you. And they will never blackmail you. And so you can feel generally when a person on earth attempts to do this um, through the different things. So our, our parents usually are quite good at it, right? And often as parents we become quite good at it because we, we don't understand any other way of controlling our children. So what we do is we use a, 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 a smooth presentation of bribery with a few threats and then final punishment just to induce the end result. Does that make sense? How many of us have done that with our children? I know that I have, right? So we have, we have this final... We, we have this threaten, punish, this punishment, and the bribe is the carrot, you know, in front of the horse that leads him along. So, and we often do this with our children. We, we, we revert between these two states, none of which, by the way, are loving, actually. 
they are a measure of our own frustration trying to understand what's going on with our child that we have no understanding about often. And many of us, when we're new parents, go, yeah, yeah, that's probably true. You know, the new parent, the first child was the test drive, the test run of bringing up. And then after that, we tried to apply the same thing to the second child. And of course, that never worked because they're a different person and a different personality. So we got to get to a point where where we didn't really understand what to do with children at all. And in a lot of ways, we gave up and got back and reverted back to these two methods of control. So threaten them when things get a bit, when they get out of hand and bribe them when everything's, you know, or, or to get them to do things that are good. Of course, it doesn't develop the child's soul very much, but in fact, it actually harms them. But that's what we do. Now, threats and bribery, because we learned them very, very young, we carry them through most of our life. And unbeknown to us, many times we're threatening other people or trying to bribe them. Right? I had, a, I had the, a lady from a current affair ring me this morning and she tried many bribes. Um, that's what happened this morning in our conversation. Like, you know, I can feel her intention and her intention is very different to the story I got from her words. But because of the cycle of threats and bribery that she has been used to all of her life, she has come to use that as a part of getting a story. And many of us do this, like even unconsciously, with our children, with our parents, particularly with our parents and children, our family relationships, we do this. Now, if a person attempts to use threats and bribes on us, whether they are on the earth or in the spirit world, they are not in a loving state. In other words, their intention isn't to give us a gift of their love. Their intention is something else. And if I'm sensitive to the feelings coming from them, the threat or the bribe, then I go, mm, OK, I can feel the bribe now. I can feel the threat now. OK, how much can I trust what's going on now if I'm feeling a bribe or a threat? Now, interestingly, spirits have gotten to use these bribes and threats as much as, and perhaps more so even, than people who are on earth do. Because, because they are the most effective way of influencing a person on earth to do something they want them to do. So um, if I can't feel the intention of the spirit, can you see, no matter, they might be saying, oh, I can tell you exactly what's going to happen to you tomorrow. And sure enough, the majority of spirits in the spirit world, unless they've just recently arrived, in the spirit world, the majority would be able to tell you exactly what's going to happen to you tomorrow. Right? It doesn't mean that their intention is good telling you. They can just tell you because they can see and foresee based on all of the different conditions around you that you can't see, they can predict it to a large degree, what's going to happen to you. Does that make sense? And so what they do is they then tell you, but they tell you in order to get you hooked into them. Because once you're hooked into them, now they can start telling you things that you will actually do because they've told you you're going to do them. Do you understand? You see, it's like, it's like if I suggest, if, if I'm in a position of authority with you and I tell you, tomorrow this is going to happen with you, and tomorrow, lo and behold, without your planning, it happens. The next thing I tell you, you're going to trust a lot more, aren't you? And then the next thing I tell you, you're going to trust a lot more than that, and so forth. Until we have so much rapport that I could tell you a lie, and you'd probably still go ahead and do it. Can you see? And if you can't feel my intention, if you can't feel the feelings coming out of me towards you, you're not going to know the difference. Can you see that? You're going to automatically do something that in the end you would regret. So, so what we've got to do is we've got to learn to feel the feelings of every person around us. To do that, we have to be open to feeling our own. That's the only thing we can do. If I re re reject all of my own feelings, it's going to be very, very hard for me to feel accurately the feelings of others. Does that make sense? So what we need to do is we need to come to feel so much that we can feel the intentions of any people around us 
And when their intentions feel loving, then we engage them. When their intentions feel unloving, then we say to them, look, I don't feel like your intention is very loving here. And you can even say that in a loving manner, can't you? You can say that to them in a loving way. I don't feel your intention is very loving here. Your intention seems to be unloving. Please explain. And then when they explain, you go, yeah, well, that's interesting you say all that, but the feeling I get from you is totally different. The feeling I get from you is the feeling, and you could describe the feeling that's coming at you from them and, uh, and describe that. So quite often you'll have a discussion with people, and I, and I reckon in your past many of you have already done this, where you've had a discussion with a person where they have a smile on their face but you actually feel like actually they don't like you very much. How many of you have felt that? That person doesn't like me. Yeah, almost all of us, right? That person doesn't like me, but they've got a smile on their face and they're acting like they like me. Now, I don't know about you, but I would find that person quite difficult to trust. Can you see? If they have a feeling they don't like me, then why have they got the smile in their face? It would be more accurate for them to have a big reverse smile on their face and being attacking of me, then that would be more honest than to have a smile on their face and then to have a feeling of rage coming out of them towards me or a feeling that they don't like me coming out. So what we need to do is we need to start trusting our feelings more. Now initially, that's quite hard because most of us have spent a whole lifetime suppressing our feelings. We've, we've spent a whole lifetime trying to get away from what we feel and also get away from what we feel or receive from others. So a lot of times when we get that feeling, oh, they don't like me, we won't even acknowledge it. How many times have you sat there with a person knowing they don't like you and you still continue the conversation? Most of us have done that in our life where we've sat there in a conversation knowing the other person doesn't like us and yet we've just sat there, taken the I don't like you barrage coming from their soul because there's a smile on their face and we don't know what else to do. Right? Now, if we're in this feeling place, we would go, no, no, hang on a sec. The feeling I get from you is that you don't like me. Can we talk about that? Do you know why you don't like me? Well, what, what are you feeling, really? Because the smile on your face is very, very different to what I'm feeling from you. Yeah? The Beatles wrote a good song about it, right? Do you remember the Beatles song, Eleanor Rigby? She leaves her face in a jar by the door. In other words, she leaves the mask that she puts on when she goes outside to meet all the other people in the world. She leaves it right by the door. When she's inside at home, that's when she's her complete self. And then when she goes outside, she puts on the mask and that's the, that's the self that everyone else sees. In a recent discussion, um, I think it was down in Melbourne a week ago or so actually, and um, we talked to a group about the three selves. And basically, what we've mentioned, and you can see this on the... I think it's on the net, isn't it, that discussion already? Um, there's the three selves. There's our real self that God created. So God created our real self. Most of which uh, most of us have no idea about yet. Then our parents created our injured self. And we created our facade, the self we would like to have been. Right? Now, most people on the planet operate in that area where they're not real even towards themselves, about themselves. Where they're operating in what they would like them to believe about themselves. So many people, you know, like to believe they're loving. But they'd certainly justify going to war. Is that loving? Well, no, it doesn't seem very loving to justify killing people, but to have them motive for doing so, that automatically transfers it from being loving 
from unloving to loving for some reason. That's our facade. Our injured self is the person who has all the emotions that we need to feel and release. But most of us don't even get there to that injured self. We spend most of our time in our facade. We, don't, we rarely get to our injured self to feel and release the emotions that cause us to actually become more open and understanding of the world we live in. And once we've felt and released that self, we get to the self that God created us to be, which is a very, very amazing person for every single individual. Right? But unfortunately, most of us never get to that point until well into the spirit world. Right? Because we've spent a life on earth living in our facade most of the time. And then when we pass over, often we're confronted with our injured self. The way, how we're confronted is we look in the mirror and our actual reflection in the mirror tells us our own condition. So we start to see the real self. The, the, the face that we put on, the pretty face we put on, you know, the one with the makeup and everything, that's that facade self that we put on. That facade self is destroyed in the process of dying in many cases. Now, for many, it's still not destroyed. There's many people in the spirit world who attempt to live the facade by denying any, so, any examination of themselves. But once they start the examination of themselves, they start seeing the complete injured self. And once they process through that emotionally, they now get to be very, very close to the person and eventually the person that God created them to be, which is a very amazing individual. Now, if you apply that to the situation with spirits, most spirits who are trying to influence us on the earth in a negative direction are still in their facade self. They're still attempting to use exactly the same techniques that they've always used on earth in order to manipulate people on earth to do what they want which is exactly what most people on earth do. See, most people on earth use techniques to manipulate other people who are close to them to do what they want. Right? You know, one form of manipulation, if I own a business, is to market the business. So AJ saying marketing a business is now a manipulation. Yes, I am. The reason why is that it's an attempt to change the person's mind without them knowing the full facts necessarily. Right? So you see a lot of marketing, what does it do? So like the marketing of Coke, can you imagine this? Coke marketing says this is uh, seven or eight teaspoons of sugar with a bit of water and a chemical mixed in. Do you see any one of the Coke advertisements saying that to you? And it actually costs us more to produce that than it does this bottle of water, but we're going to charge more for the water than we are for the Coke. <laughs> Can you see them saying that to you ever? Right. Has any one of you seen the... Uh, there's a, another interesting movie, I think, it, it, that expands your mind a bit called... Um, it's a teenage movie, actually. It's called Interstate 60. You ever heard of that? Well worth going to your video store and having a watch. In this movie... There's a man who's, 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 who's um, he, he's basically chosen for his entire life to expose truth. And any person who is not truthful with him, he actually r is right down the line with. And in the movie, I won't tell you much more than that, in the movie you see how far down the line he is with regard to somebody telling him the truth or sticking to an agreement with him. And it's quite funny, actually, the way the, where it goes. But the, the truth is, unfortunately, on the earth, we are often not in a condition of truth with other people because we're in our facade and we want something from them and they want something from us and we go, yeah, am I willing to give them what they want so that I get what... Oh, yeah, I am. So I give them what they want so that I get what we want. And nobody's really giving gifts anymore of love. We are all in an emotional bartering system. Does that make sense? Now, we want to get away from an emotional bartering system if we want to love. But, but unfortunately, many spirits who have passed over are also in an emotional bartering system with us. And unless we can feel their facade and feel their real feelings, their, their injured self and their God self, unless we can feel that, it's going to be very hard for us to determine the difference of when a spirit comes to talk to us about something, of determining the difference of whether they're loving us or they're actually using us. 
And this is why dealing with our own, getting closer to God and dealing with your own emotions is also so important in your relationship with spirits. But the main question I would ask, if I can't do that, and I would suggest that we all want to get to the stage where we can do that, but if I can't do that, in the interim I need to ask myself a question. I just need to ask myself, did that seem like a loving interaction? That's all I need to ask myself. So in other words, a spirit comes along and says, oh, and, and implies to you that we should go in this direction. And you stop for a moment and say, why do you want to go there? And they say, don't question it. Now, does that seem like a loving thing to say to you? Don't question it. You're allowed to question anything, are you not? And if a spirit really loves you, wouldn't they let you question it? But they'd want you to question it in a loving manner, wouldn't they? Not in an attacking manner or a st stupid way. They'd want you to be open-minded enough to question it in a loving manner. But they'd be open to you questioning, wouldn't they? Of course. Yeah. So, so allow yourself to ask the question. Whoever is influencing me, whether they're on the earth or in the spirit world, does it feel to me like their intention was loving? If it doesn't feel like the intention was loving, just say to them, look, at the moment I don't feel like your intention is loving. And I don't know why I don't feel that, but I don't. And can we just leave that and we'll come back to it another time? If you don't know. You can easily do that, can't you? So my suggestion is, do that until such a time as you can feel everyone around you. And when you can feel everyone around you, you will no longer need to worry about what a person's intention is or not. You will feel them so strongly that you will automatically know how to interact with them. Yes, I, I, I can see all of that. Yep. But yesterday you were saying to one of the ladies, um, you don't rely totally on yourself. Is there not a way that you could ask for guidance in this? Of course. God is always willing to guide you. But unfortunately, God is also limited by your own emotional capacity to guide you. So, so this is you... God is all, always there willing to answer every single longing you have from your soul, which is every single prayer you have. God's willing to answer in a direct manner. However, our ability emotionally to receive those answers directly is very limited, generally, particularly when we begin with our soul work, because we are so closed down to the method of communication by which God communicates with us, which is through our feelings and emotions. Uh, through our soul desires and passions. And so, and so while we can certainly initially, and in fact my, my feelings are always take to God every single thing, we need to be aware that there are external influences upon us limited by our own personal condition. So we've got to do two things. We've got to trust God first, and then secondly, we've got to learn how to feel so that we can accurately feel the responses of every single person around us. Yeah? And I would call that, so, so if you think about the divine love path altogether, it's really three things. It's having a longing for God's love. So that is a longing that comes from your heart right, to God for, to receive God's love. And it has to be a pure longing. It can't be a longing that's going that's manipulative you know, or, or controlling. You know? Damn you, God, give me your love, you know, that kind of thing. But also we often have that emotion, you know, like uh, going towards God. Of, why doesn't God love me anyway? And why should I have to long for it? We have a lot of anger and rage with God. And we're going to have to deal with those things if, before we can have a real strong longing for God's love. The second thing we need to have a longing for is a longing for God's truth. Now, what I mean by longing for God's truth is we must long with all of our heart to receive truth that we personally, at this point, don't agree with. Because trust me, if we agreed with all of God's truth, we would already be very, very close to God and we wouldn't even need to ask the question of what is true and what is not. right? And it's by longing for God's truth that we actually give up the right of our own truth. And that doesn't mean that we're easily led. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We are open to all sorts of 
indications of truth, but only the stuff that becomes a part of our personal experience do we actually embrace. If we long for God's truth, we are content to actually give up our own truth in deference to a much larger truth. So in other words, your truth might be that you're quite angry with your next-door neighbour because he keeps on chopping down his trees and letting them fall over onto your yard and you have to go and pick them up. And that's your truth. God's truth is that you must love your enemy. <laughs> that's God's truth. Do you see? Now... I have to now have some process of giving up my hatred of my neighbour in deference to God's truth. And that process is going to be an emotional process because I've obviously got an emotion of anger towards my neighbour. So therefore, how do I? there must be an emotion that I'm going to have to release in order to, to love my neighbour again. Right? That's what it means to long for God's truth, to be able to actually give up what we want to do in deference to what the loving thing is to do and actually then address the emotion in us that causes us to take the unloving action. Do you? Does that make sense? And then the third thing is to be humble to your own emotions in particular. Now, if we learn true humility, we will automatically learn how to feel everyone else because when we're humble to our own emotions we now start feeling all of our own emotions and we go oh that's there that feels like this and that feels like that I recognize all of those emotional feelings right and then as a result of that I'm humbled to my own emotion and as I'm humbled to my own emotion I am now able to feel the emotions of others without responding negatively to their emotions so in other words I, if I feel an emotion of to somebody else going um, for example, I feel an emotion towards um, a person who's, who I know wants to attack me. And they've got a smile on their face, but I know that they would like to harm me. What I would do, is, so if I love myself and I'm humble, is I'd own that emotion and I'd feel it. I wouldn't try to attack them first. <laughs> you know, what do they call it? A preemptive strike against the other, because I know they're going to do that to me at some point. What I would do is I'd feel all my emotions about that, release those emotions and get to a point where I actually can love the person and then go up to them and say, actually, I can feel you've got this uh, feeling in you that you want to attack me. And when they say, oh, no, I haven't, you go, well, I'm sorry, but I can feel it. So I feel you have. You would be firm about it because you're humble to your own emotion and you therefore can feel your own emotion. But you would also be humble enough to discuss it with them without feeling angry or resentful towards them. Can you see? Now when you're in that state, as a person, whether the pers people around you are on earth or in the spirit world who are trying to influence you, they will have barely any influence on you unless they are loving. That's the only time they'll actually influence you. So people will come up to you and they'll have loving suggestions to you and because they love you and you can feel the love, you go, okay, I'll consider that suggestion and you may even take them on. But there'll be other people who you can feel an unloving intention from them. It feels like a demand, an expectation, an attack, punishment or some other kind of emotion that you can feel as an unloving emotion and you'll go, no, I'm sorry, I just don't want to engage with that with you. And you'll know what to do in every situation automatically as a result. Yeah. Can we have the mic just... Um, <clears throat> in a very practical way, um, there is a situation where um, a woman's come and, and kissed and hugged me and I've confronted that I feel the emotion of she's got the smile on her face. It is there something that you're feeling angry with me about? No, complete denial. Mm -hmm. And, um, and didn't, didn't want to take that issue or discuss that any mm -hmm. further. Yep. Now, every time I see her, there's a kiss and a hug, hello. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel authentic at all to me to engage in a loving embrace, mm. yet am I being judgmental or am I restraining or withholding love or truth? Well, I feel you're withholding truth. 
because it, because if a if a person come up to me and said that and I said that to them the first time and I can feel yeah the kiss and hug is all fake, and then they come up to me again and do try to do the same thing, I wouldn't be accepting the second kiss and hug. I'd be saying, hang on a sec, just stop for a moment. I still feel the same emotion from you. You're giving me a kiss and hug, but actually you don't like me very much. And I feel it. I feel it very strongly. Yep. Yet they don't want to go there because it would create a. A, a, you know, an interruption in friendship. You know, it's like it's based on the whole facade. Exactly. Yeah. And you would, you could then say to them, "I don't want my relationships to be based upon a facade. I want my relationships to be based upon truth. So, what's going on between us? I want to know what's going on. Now, if you don't want to do that with me, then I feel we're not going to be very close until you want to work that out. Mm. So, there's plenty of people who come up to me and say, you know. Um, Say they have one set of emotions and I feel them and they go, mm, sorry, it's a completely other set of emotions. And then I raise that with them. Usually if I raise it with them and they don't want to talk about it, they don't come up to me again. But, but if they come up to me again, I say, well, what about the last time? Have you dealt with that yet? <laughs> and, and actually I will continue at that every time they come up. Mm. Every time. And a lot of people get very annoyed with me as a result. So it, right? uh, even like even... As I see her approaching, I'm always confronted with, you know, now I can say I actually can't open my arms to embrace you because I still am feeling an inauthentic yep. exchange. However, the question I'd ask you, though, is yeah. why haven't you already said this? You Be see, there's a fear in you. Well, someone actually said that we can't feel somebody else's emotions when we're in so much error within ourselves, so maybe it's my... Well, I just go. I asked yeah. all of you a question where you have felt the emotion of someone who doesn't like you smiling at you, and almost all of you put up your hand that you, you've had a situation where you've actually felt that. So the reality is, you can feel that other people's reality, emotions. Yeah. And in fact, as children, we were so sensitive to feeling another person's emotions that in a lot of day, a lot of times, we shut down our own emotion so much in order to please the other emotion. Many of us have learnt to do that too. So yes, I do agree that we need to increase our sensitivity to the emotion, both our own and other people. But as you do that, many of you are, uh, are not even trusting the process right from the beginning. I think with me too, because my throat's starting to burn as I speak, what I've realised is I take the facade, no, everything's fine, I don't have an issue with you, and leave it as that. Why? Instead of really feeling and being humble within my own feelings and relating to her on more of a soul level, yes. which could open a potentiality of engaging more in a soul interaction. So yes. dropping the facade within myself, allowing her to really drop, so dropping to a deeper level of... Humility and feeling. Yes. Why do you withdraw? Draw, draw and I from would that? avoid that because I would be shake. I, I would shake in front of her. Yep. So your own fear of your mother in this case would <laughs> cause you to actually go into this thing of oh, I'm confronting someone now. How are they going to respond? They'll get angry with me. Yeah. I'm trying to now prevent their anger. And why am I preventing their anger? Because I'm trying to prevent my response to anger, which is fear. Yeah. And I, so I'm actually in the whole whole reason why I'm closing down my throat is because. In other words, closing down my voice mm. in the situation is because I want to prevent my own fear. Yeah. So it's actually a selfish motive in, most of the time. Yeah, and standing in front of her, quivering and shaking in that. You don't want to see you. She, you don't want to see yourself doing that in front of her. Yeah, which is obviously scared to lose my facade. Exactly, because what happens usually as a child when we go into this fear place, the person who's attacking us generally feels like they're afraid of me. Isn't this great? Let's hammer them some more. And most of us as a child got hammered quite a lot by being in fear. So we learnt to put on this real, you know, bravado, like anger. Instead, we used anger as the defence of our fear. Whereas we've got to now unlearn that. We've got to learn now to let our fear be present and just be humble. And if that person now wants to choose to damage us further through them seeing our fear, then that's their choice. And if we remain humble... What will happen is we'll get to the grief of it, we'll release it, and highly unlikely we would attract those events in the future. However, if we don't do that, we'll attract event after event after event after event until such a time as we release that emotionally. So the fear inside of you that you don't wish, wish to feel is dominating the interaction with the woman. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it also feels like that every single interaction that I have that I'm afraid to be vulnerable is blocking my connection with God. 
So, it, well, it firstly blocks your connection with yourself. And whenever you block your connection with yourself, it's instantaneous that every other connection gets blocked. So it would be far more powerful to confront every inauthentic relationship than sit in my room and pray for an hour. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And in fact, if you set your intention, that is automatically the prayer to do that. And in the process, you'll bring the situations to you and eventually heal that emotion. And when you, once you've healed that emotion, you'll feel free for the first time. Well, I did it twice this week with two other people and I was literally jumping like a child yeah. afterwards in such exhilaration. Yeah. And I asked God, who else, who, who else do I have an authentic relationship? And now this... This girl's just popped up Pops as up. you talk about it. Exactly. Thank you. The, the issue we face is that if we love, you'll be surprised about the power of it when you love in a pure manner. You'll be surprised about the power. You see, most of us are in the fear so much that we're so afraid to be truthful and loving. And because of that, we are not truthful and loving. We, we, we do things that are not truthful and loving. We're not as open as we could be. We're not as honest as we could be. We're not forthright. We're not exposed. We don't expose our true feelings. We don't expose our emotions to other people. We try to close them all down and suppress them and act a bit cool and all those kind of things. And as a result of all of that, we are presenting the inauthentic self. And as a result, we're going to get the inauthentic self back. So this is where, if you really want to have close relationships in your life, really close relationships in your life, the first person that needs to be authentic, loving and truthful is ourself. And once we do that, you'll start finding that other people around you will automatically feel like doing that with you. That's why a lot of you, have, many, many people who meet me actually, come up to me and confess their darkest secrets just in first invitation. First the first meeting, right? Why would they do that? Because inside of themselves they can feel that I'm open with them and also I'm not going to judge their feelings. Right? So they come up to me and talk to me about their feelings. But many of them have not even told their wife that they have or their husband that they have that feeling. Why? Because they can feel the judgment that's present automatically. They can feel the inauthenticity of the relationship already. So the key is to engage authentic relationships. Engage the people around you in an authentic way. Everyone, children, parents, everyone around you. Now, initially, that's going to be quite confronting, isn't it, to them? Yeah? But after a while, everyone around you will just love it because they know they're getting the real self. They know they're getting the real person. They know they don't have to fake anything. They know they don't have to try. They know they're going to be loved no matter how, how they're, um, you know, what they do in their life. Right? They still know they're going to be loved even if they don't like you. <laughs> That's pretty reliable, isn't it? So in the end, yeah, it can be a very beautiful place that you create. And people become very attracted to that, like bees to a honeypot, as the saying goes, or moths to a flame, you know? They're attracted to that love that's demonstrated to them, despite themselves. You know, many of you have been attracted to come along to meetings like this despite yourself, yes? You know, this guy thinks he's Jesus, this is already a problem, right? Before anything else begins, and it's only a lot of times the openness, my openness and my love and my, that comes out in these discussions with people that you observe that then causes the attraction. Does that make sense? And that's what you will feel with everyone around you if, you, if you're authentic with everyone around you. It's the same thing. It's a matter of being authentic, truthful, honest, open, loving with everyone around you. And if it comes from your heart, they'll feel that from your heart. And they go, oh, I'm attracted to them. I don't even really know why, you know. Like they seem a bit crazy to me, but I'm still attracted to them, you know. Like I don't understand. And they have some way out beliefs, you know. They, they way out beliefs there. Uh, and, they, you know, they believe in spirits, can talk to them and things like that. But I still feel attracted to them. I don't understand why. And it's because of the authentic presentation of yourself that people will be attracted to that's what i meant in the first century when i said let your light shine to the world like not under a basket don't hide yourself under the basket don't put yourself in the unauthentic self that i was talking about earlier hide yourself be your authentic self and also learn to as you increase your love and truth you'll become brighter and brighter and people around you will just be attracted to that now if a person's been 
on listening to the divine truth for year, for years and been on the divine love path for years now and every single person they talk to still rejects them then the question has to be asked am i living in my authentic self yet because if i was living in my authentic self people would be attracted to me not repelled do you follow people are automatically attracted to people who live in their authentic self so if i'm if i'm still getting rejected after years and years and years of doing it then I've got to start questioning whether I'm really in my authentic self yet or not. Have I really done much work on living in love and truth yet? Let's go. And then over here. Is there another mic over here? If you leave your hand up so Anto can bring the mic down. <coughs> Hello. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. 2,000 years ago. Yep. You got very close to God. Four questions. How? Let, let me write some of them down. That way I remember them. How did I get close to God? Yes. Uh, I just wrote off the answer. Right. That's how. Okay. Yeah. In the sphere... All I did was those three things. Right. That's all. Thank you. Yep. In the sphere 10, when you arrived up there... Yep. How did you get to 20? Um, by applying the same three things. Right. Yep. Thank you. Today. Yep. EJ, how much time, how much energy, how much love, how much determination do you put into being close to God? And how do you actually do that? Okay. Um, in, in my own life, my relationship with God is the primary relationship. So my, all of my energy and determination goes primarily into that relationship first. So even these discussions that I'm having with you are secondary. They're part of my passion, but they're secondary to my primary passion, which is my relationship with God. My passions basically are very simple. My first passion is my relationship with God. All right? Sorry about that. My second passion is my relationship with myself. And in myself, don't forget, I include my other half. Right. So in other words, my relationship with my soulmate is a part of my relationship with myself. And therefore, my relationship with Mary is a primary passion. So, set but secondary to my relationship with God. In other words, if in my relationship with Mary, I have a conflict with my relationship with God, my relationship with God takes primary precedence every time. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Yep. And then thirdly, my other passions are whatever I want to do with my life. So, they're down here. All right? But what I've found is if I put my relationship with God as the primary motivating force in my own personal life, every other thing that I desire to do, I finish up doing ironically. And that's what I meant in the first century by seek first God's kingdom and all these other things will be added to you. You see, what we often do is we seek first the relationship with our partner, first children for you know other things some of us don't even think seek anything with people we seek first relationship with our money supplier or our bank or whatever and we often put a lot of effort into that uh, and i've had a bit of my life this time where i actually tried doing that it wasn't very sa satisfactory in a sense that it didn't satisfy my heart very much once i focus my primary relationship with god and i do those other three things that i had written there Every single bit of progression I have ever made in my entire life has been based upon putting God first. And it doesn't mean subjecting myself to God's will, as people think it means. See, God's will is that you become the person God created you to be. In other words, God's will is for you to come to recognise your own passions and desires in a pure, loving manner and follow those desires to the full extent. And ironically, at that point, not only will you be in a lot of happiness because you're following your own desires passionately, you will actually be also doing God's will for you, which is that you follow your own desires passionately. 
as long as those desires are harmonious with love and truth. So, so my focus has always been that first, the relationship with God. And then secondly, my relationship with myself includes the other half of myself. See, what a lot of people do with their relationship with themselves nowadays is they just have a relationship with themselves and they're very, very blocked to the other half of themselves, whomever that be, whether it be male or female. And what I'm finding is as I also sort out issues with my relationship with myself and therefore with my soulmate, Mary, I'm also at the same time, it's assisting me in my growth of my relationship with God, my primary passion. The beauty of doing it that way is that uh, you will always continue progressing no matter who is around you. See, what happens for a lot of people is they go along in life progressing until such a time as they are happy with their or contented with all of their current relationships. The difference between that and myself is I am never content in the sense of content to remain the same in my relationship with God. In other words, I have a strong desire to continue growing my relationship with God no, wonder how, no matter how wonderful it already is. And I also have exactly the same passion and desire with my soulmate to, to grow my relationship with my soulmate no matter how wonderful it is uh, already. I still have a desire to continue to make it even more wonderful. And those two primary passions, along with those three things I mentioned, the longing for God's love, the longing for God's truth and humility, are the things that have kept me growing for 2,000 years. Yeah? And it's only those things, actually, that have kept me growing. And I've observed in many others times when they have stopped. And primarily it's because of the lack of relationship with God or the lack of desire for it to increase in its capacity. So for myself, there's always a desire for it to continue increasing, continue increasing, continue increasing. Although I am very happy with what it is, I am also desirous of it improving. I want to know God even better than I do now, always. And that's been my history all the time, and Mary's too. And this is why we have the same soul quality in that regard. And my relationship with my soulmate is the same in the sense that... And also, you'll notice... In time, the same thing with Mary. You'll see the same passion in her, that she's very, very focused on those same two things. And that's the quality, that is a quality that's a natural sort of a quality of our soul, I suppose you could say. But it is something that we have to nurture and grow. So my suggestion is if you want to continuously grow through the rest of your existence, there are the things to focus on. Now, when I talk about God, unfortunately, most people go all religious, you know what I mean? Like they all act, start acting holy and, you know, they start talking about religious truth as comparison compared to real truth. And they start um, talking about theories and what I would call philosophies of man and implying that God actually agrees with these philosophies. I'm not saying that. God, I feel, is just my father and mother. God is my parent. That's how I see God and that's how I've always seen God. God isn't some kind of person who desires my worship. Although, as you get to know God more, there is a feeling that you want to worship God more as you progress. But God is more of an individual that I can have a personal relationship with. A friendship, if you like. Not based on fear or any other emotion that many religious movements base their relationship on. Not, not based on following a whole heap of rules, because when you love, eventually there becomes only one rule, and that is the law of love, right? So, so at the end of the day, God to me is a real entity, a real being with whom I have a personal relationship and can feel the emotions of. And as a result, that relationship to me has brought me every single thing I've ever enjoyed. It's brought me every single thing, including my soulmate. Um, that relationship. In fact, if I did not engage my relationship with God in this life, I would never have met Mary again in this life. Right? It's only my relationship with God that has brought me all the other things. And what, what I'd like to do is encourage each of you to stop thinking about God as some kind of far-off religious idea 
and start thinking about God as your mother or your father, but not the kind of mother and father you've actually had in this life, but a kind of mother and father that far exceeds in, in regards to love any single person you could ever imagine spending time with. And that you, inside of yourself, have the capacity to experiment with receiving love from that being. And all that I'm trying to do when I'm doing these seminars with people is encourage them to begin experimenting with the fact that they can receive God's love and to begin experimenting with it to the point where they're willing to see what's blocking the reception of that love and to actually give them some degree of confidence if they really long for that love and really long for that truth that it will come to them. And there is, there is so much truth aside from that that we can talk about but this is the primary truth, I feel, that every single person on the planet at least needs to be presented with. They don't have to make the choice to do it. They just need to be presented with the idea of it. right? And then make their own decision as to what they wish to do. And all I'm attempting to do is to present each person I meet with the idea of it. Because it's not an idea that we've really followed up on much on the, on the planet. Many people have been religious, right? Many, many of you have been, have you not? Been religious or had some kind of religious background when you were a child, probably, for many of us. Um, but, but when it comes to God, we still have this really obscure viewpoint that is very much tainted, as I said yesterday, by feelings of punishment and you know, like wrath and, and also feelings that maybe God doesn't even exist. And in a recent discussion we did in Melbourne, I discussed how to find out whether God exists or not and how to find out the truth about God. But until you're presented with the possibility that you could have a relationship with God if you wanted one, you're never going to try to have one. And, and it's not the kind of relationship that religion has actually presented to you. It's not like that. Right? It's not going to create a sort of like a cult or a or a movement or anything like that. It's your personal relationship with God. It's got nothing to do with anyone else. Nothing to do with me or anyone else. Right? And if you have that as your primary focus and that as your next focus, so your relationship with Jesus will come down in the list here somewhere. You follow me? Can you see the error straight away with most Christian thought? The relationship with Jesus is put there or there. Right? Straight away we're in error when we do that, you see? The relationship with Jesus should be coming same down, same down as your relationship with anybody else who loves you, which will be way, way under the first two primary relationships that you will ever develop. The relationship with God and the relationship with yourself and your own mate. Yeah? So when you focus on your relationship with me, rather than focusing on your relationship with God and your soulmate and yourself, you are automatically out of harmony with what God's designed for you to experience in, the, in its purest form. Does that make sense? So let yourself go for those relationships and don't use anybody else as a substitution for those relationships. Right? Do you know what I mean by that? See, often we use our parents in a, as a substitution for our relationship with God. So in other words, we expect our parents to be gods almost. We expect our parents to be highly reliable. All the things we project at our parents, we often, as a feeling, should have towards God, our real parent. right? And often with our soulmate, we often have lots of different feelings we're projecting at them because of our emotional injuries towards the uh, opposite gender or the same gender we have all of these blockages towards ever knowing who our mate is or we have a lot of blockages even with ourselves don't we when you think about it now how many of us are blocked to our own emotion you know that we don't want to feel our own emotion even can you see so if I'm blocked to my own emotion and I'm blocked to my soulmate's emotions then I'm not going to be very focused on this part of my development and if I'm blocked to God and blocked to the concept that God actually can have a personal relationship with me then I'm not going to have that part of my development and then all of my development has to rely on what happens underneath that 
Now, there's a name for that that I've given it historically, and I've called that the natural love path. Developing the love that comes out of us towards another is development there. It's not something to be ridiculed because love is always something to be enjoyed. So don't think that I'm ridiculing any path that brings you closer to loving another person. However, if you do not focus on your relationship with God and your relationship with yourself and your soulmate, in the end you will always have a distortion in your own enjoyment of life. Right? And this is where I feel many uh, Christians have a lot of issue because they put Jesus above their relationship with God. They view me as a part of the Godhead and therefore they're putting me on equal terms or even greater. They talk about me more than they talk about God most of the time. For them, often God is a far off being and Jesus, because he lived on earth, is a bit closer to them. Right? And as a result of that, they have far more connection and projections than me but they've already got the whole part of it upside down because it's a relationship with God that I'm just a man, just like you are a man or a woman. I'm just a human. So I can't do for you what God can do. I'm never going to be able to do for you what God can do, no matter how powerful I individually become right? with my, with my soul mate. I'm never going to be able to do what God can do for you. I can't give you God's love even. I can't do that. Many people pray to me asking for God's love to enter them. I, I can't do it because I, I don't have God's love. God has God's love and it has to be an emotion coming from God. And the same applies with this. Like, Why put me above your relationship with yourself or your relationship with another person, your soul mate? Right? It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't do that. <laughs> I would never do that. I wouldn't put you above my relationship with my soulmate or my relationship with myself. To me, that's a very important relationship. You know, you just invite me to sit in your car. If, if there's a chance of me sitting with Mary, I'll be sitting with Mary, wherever that is. If, if it's in the back seat somewhere. Right? Because I want my relationship with my soulmate to continue to grow. That's what I want. And, and any other relationship should become below that. Relationship with parents, children, and so forth and so forth should all become below that. And when we get all of that out of kilter, we get it all mixed up, unhappiness begins to develop in our life. So when we love our children more than we love our own partner who we created the child with, our relationship is automatically distorted. We've automatically gone out of kilter. If we love our children more than we love God, our relationship is automatically out of kilter. Many people love their children more than they love God. Like I would say, the majority of the human race at the moment loves children more than they love God. But God gave us the ability to have children. It doesn't make much sense to me, but, but that's what we do. And so we've got to learn to place things in the right priority in our lives if we're really going to have love and enjoyment in our lives. And the problem with this is what we do is we substitute things. We substitute our parents for our relationship with God. We substitute any interaction with the opposite gender or if we're in a you know, homosexual or lesbian partnership with the same gender as a relationship with my soulmate. In other words, we're constantly looking for a relationship with the one ideal person but what we do, because we feel we're never going to find them, we're so disillusioned that we feel we're never going to find the one person, that, the soulmate that God created, there's the two halves, we feel, well, any other thing will do. So any other thing does do for a period of time, generally. And usually it's always for a period of time and then it breaks up and then we have another one and it breaks up and then another one and it breaks up and so forth. And it's all because we're not focused on the priority system that God has created that brings us the most enjoyment. Does that answer the question? You've got the mic there still, haven't you? I thank you very much. Yes, it does actually. Yep. I just wondered how much energy you put into being with God. I, if, if I had to rate it as a percentage, like probably... 100%? Well, no, well, that's not possible because you've mm. got all these other relationships mm. in place. Mm. But I, I'd say a good 90% of my energy goes for primarily... Every moment as you're talking, as you're thinking, as you're sharing with Even us. while I'm talking yeah, with you, yeah, I'm yeah. feeling yeah. my relationship with yeah, God more yeah. than I'm feeling mm. each person mm. here. Mm. Yep. Mm. And mm. E when I'm with Mary, it's exactly mm. the same. Mm. Uh, you both, yes. Mm. Yep. Mm. And so, so, but... Ironically, it enhances the enjoyment of every mm. other relationship. Mm. 
that's the irony. You have the power to enjoy additional relationships because you've got so much of a relationship with God. And that's uh, what I really enjoy about the whole thing is when you, set, when you do set your soul's intention, your heart's intention towards God first, all the other things do get added to you. All the things you think you wanted first all come anyway. So you don't need to worry so much about it. But it's not, it's not like a lot of the religions portray. You see, a lot of the religions portray God as an angry, wrathful being you know, who has a whole set of uh, people he favours and a whole set of people who are ill-favoured. And they portray God with a lot of very nasty characteristics and attributes. And as a result of that, they don't understand God and cannot connect to God. And therefore, they're left... In this area down here where they're not connecting with God, they're not connecting themselves very well either because connection with God enhances the connection with self. And so what they're doing is they're living in a place of fear most of the time rather than a place of love. And most religions fall into the same category in that they're all living in a place of fear. They're all like engendering fear even. You think of all the rules they have. How many of their rules are based around fear? The fear of disappointing an angry God. And yet, you know, once you put that relationship first, you start realizing that actually God's not angry at all. God has no reason to be angry, does she? If you created everything perfectly and everything was working perfectly, in your opinion, would you ever have a feeling of anger? No. Why would God have a feeling of anger? God's never got a feeling of anger. Doesn't matter what you do. What would God give you free will and then tell you that something you did could make God angry but God's exposing himself if he does that to everybody him being angry with everyone <laughs> does that make sense if if I give you the gift if God gives you the gift rather of free will not not myself if God gives you the gift of free will and then says to you if you break this gift I'm going to get angry with you then God has now exposed himself to becoming angry with all of the world and all of the people in the spirit world because all of them may choose to use their gift in a, matter, in a manner that disappoints God. But if God says to you, I give you the gift of free will and God is perfectly happy no matter how you use it, you can see God would never be unhappy with any individual. And how wrong would it be actually to be unhappy with an individual who uses their free will, no matter how they use it, if you gave them the gift in the first place? It doesn't make much sense, does it? And yet we're often being told, you know, God's going to be disappointed or angry. God's wrath is going to come down on you. All these different things. The whole Old Testament in the Bible has, is littered with all of that. And a fair bit of the New Testament, by the way, too. You know, the book of Revelation, this whole... This whole portrayal of God as being this angry God is going to come to punish the world and so forth. And it's all so wrong. However, and, however, what is the next stage that you're talking about in the next year and a half? What is that? Well, it's not God's punishment. No. It's the direct result of our own uh -huh. inability to listen to our own feelings as a human race. I, you know, the average audience that comes along to one of their groups, I ask them, how many of them are aware through their own experience, like they've had personal dreams or they've had, they've had some kind of vision of some events coming up that they feel will be cataclysmic to the earth? How many people are, have personally experienced that? Now, usually in the audience, there's a good 5 to 10% of the entire audience that at least has had a personal experience of that. Now, if we were all listening to them, we'd be all going, yeah, that's pretty unusual. That all of those people who don't know each other all have the same thing going on. Well, how does that work? And they're all from different walks of life. They're all different individuals. Some are highly educated. Some are not educated at all. Some are, you know, been people who have been talking to spirits since their childhood. Others have had no spirit interaction whatsoever. You have people from all different religious backgrounds and yet they're all thinking the same thing. For goodness sake, we even have movies about it now. Right? And we all just keep on going, nah, it's not going to happen, hey. It's not going to happen. And you don't need somebody else to tell you it's going to happen. The truth is many of you already know. 
Yeah. However, as a single person, how yep. do you counteract that? How do you counteract what? The creation that everyone else is creating around them. And oh, I, I never want to create, counteract no. your creation. Why would you ever want to counteract another's creation? That's their free will in action. They're allowed to actually feel what they feel. However, if the, if the planet is suffering and the world is suffering, our water system is suffering. Yep. Our natural resources are depleted. I agree. Who do we change first? Myself. Ah. Myself is the only person I can change. So you let it all happen around you? Yes, of course. That's their free will in action. If I change myself, and a part of changing myself is embracing everything that I feel and everything that I know and everything that I believe through my relationship with God and my passions and desires, that's all part of attaching mm. to myself. And now I'm attached to God and attached to myself. I am just going to tell people freely, I don't care whether they're afraid or not afraid and I don't care whether what they think of me, what their opinion is, if they think I'm nuts or not. I'm not going to care about any of that. I'm already attached to myself so strongly that actually I know what I believe. Mm. And no one else is going to very easily influence me unless they're coming from a condition of love. Mm. Then they can very easily influence me because I'll allow them because that's my connection with myself. Mm. And so what I would do then is I would then go and, like my passion is, speak to the world about these truths. The world doesn't have to listen in fact, if I'm invested emotionally in the world listening, then I've got a problem. Nobody has to listen because they all have free will. God's given them this gift. Every single person here has free will. Every people in the world who doesn't want to listen to anything has free will. Any person who wants to murder has free will. God gave them this gift. It's not up to me to change their, their mind. All it's up to me to do is follow my passion. And my passion is to tell people the truth about what's really going on and let them make up their mind. That's my passion. So that's why I do that. Even though I get attacked, it's still my passion. Does that make sense? Mm. And so I don't have to change you. I don't have to change anyone. The only person I can change, in fact, myself. is myself. Mm. So as long as I focus on myself, that I become more loving, I become more truthful. Every day I become more truthful. Every day I become more loving because of the work I do. Every day I want to have a closer relationship with God then people around me will automatically see the difference between a person who doesn't and a person who does. But if I don't change myself, and I expect you to change first, mm. now I'm projecting all this anger at you, why aren't you changing, What's you know? I've got all these expectations mm. on you, and then when you don't change, I feel disappointed, mm. <laughs> you know, which is unhappy, and why would I want to be unhappy about what you choose to do? So there's all this stuff that goes on if I now expect you to change. So th the truth is that if I have an expectation of another person to change, I need to give it up. I need to emotionally give it up, not intellectually. Freedom. I need to emotionally give it up, yeah, and that's real freedom. Mm -hmm. And once I emotionally give it up, I don't expect any audience to ever listen to me again. I don't expect any audience to ever donate a single cent to, to what I'm trying to achieve. I don't expect any audience to pay for any DVD that I give away. I don't expect anybody in the audience to pay for any service that I provide to them. I don't expect any personal discussion to be rewarded. And once you get into that state where you know all you can change is yourself and you feel that in your heart and you don't try to change others, ironically, that's when they start to you. feel the love. Mm. A change around you. And that's where they feel like they want to change mm. and they want to embrace the, the, what seems to be a dream initially that can be a reality. Yeah. So I don't have any feeling of having you, making another person feel or think a certain thing. I will, however, say the truth to every person, mm. what I feel in the moment. And the truth tomorrow might be very different to the truth today in the sense that today I might feel the truth to be this thing and then I might go through this emotional process tonight where I have a big cry about something and my relationship with God gets closer and in that relationship I discover another truth that I didn't know today. And then so tomorrow I'll tell you a different one, mm. a different truth. Mm. Does that make sense? Add to it. And my, the only thing that I have to be very careful of, being a person that's telling these things, is I need to be careful that I'm open to correcting any untruth. Mm. That's all. Mm. And I do that as soon as I possibly can.
And that's simple, hey? Yes. Isn't it? In a way, it's like... Oh, oh, oh yes. It's not easy, <laughs> <laughs> but it's simple. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No worries. My pleasure. Any other questions? Or is it time? It's probably time for a break, eh? It's about three o'clock, isn't it? Or ten past or something. Is that about right? Five past? Shall we have a break for half an hour again and proceed after the break? That'd be good.